you will hear a woman phoning the local council about an abandoned vehicle. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Environmental Health Department, Paul speaking. Oh, hello. Um, I wanted to report a vehicle that's been left parked near where I live. I think it's been abandoned. I wondered if the council could arrange to get it towed away. Have I got through to the right department? Yes, you have. If I could just take a few details. Your name, please. Mrs. Shefford. Thank you. It's not my vehicle, though. I just thought someone ought to report it. No, that's fine. What I need to do is take some details first, then we can decide what to do about the problem. Oh, I see. So the next thing I need to know is your address. Right, it's 41 Lower Green Street. Yes. Barrowdale. And the postcode's WH45JP. Fine. And if I could just ask for a telephone number? It's... 01778-552387. I'm out quite a lot, but you can just leave a message on the answer phone if you need to. Or I could give you my mobile number. That's all right, don't worry. Now, could you tell me a little more about this vehicle? You say it's been abandoned. Well, it certainly looks like it. Can you give me an idea of where it is? Yes, it's near the main road that goes through Barrowdale. Is that the A69? Yes, that's right. Now, there's the primary school just towards the end of the village, and then next to that, next to the children's playground, there's a field, and it's in there. Oh. I wonder how it got in there. Well, there's a gate to allow farm machinery in and out. I, I thought something ought to be done about it. The children from the school might start playing in the vehicle and lock themselves in or something. Yes. You are quite right to report it. And what type of vehicle are we talking about here? It's a van, actually. You know, the sort with just a couple of little windows at the back. Right. You don't happen to know the make and model, do you? Oh, yes. I went and had a look and got all the details. I thought you might need them. I'm surprised the school hasn't contacted you about it. Anyway, I wrote the details down. Uh, right. It's a Katala... And the model's a Flyer 2000. Is that F-L-Y-E-R? That's right. Very good. And the colour? Well, it's not all that easy to see because it's absolutely filthy. And actually, it looks as if it's had a paint job at some stage. It's blue, but you can just see white underneath where it's been scratched. Right. Well, I'll just make a note of the present colour... And if you could just tell me the vehicle number. Did you make a note of that? Oh, yes. It's S322GEC. OK. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10 on page 128. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And it sounds as if the general condition of the vehicle isn't too good, from what you say. No, it's pretty poor. It wouldn't be drivable. It's got a flat tyre and there's a crack in the windscreen. I reckon someone just wanted to get rid of it. That's usually the way. It's been there for nearly a week. No, it must be eight days. I remember it was a Sunday morning when I noticed it. It wasn't there the day before. I walked past it most days on the way to the shops. I'd have thought the school would have reported it. Does the field actually belong to the school? 
No, it's part of Hill Farm Estate. Right. I'll just make a note of that. And I don't suppose you have any information about who might own the vehicle? No, I've no idea. So what will you do now? Well, we'll come and have a look and see if we can trace the owner. And if we can't, the vehicle will be removed as rapidly as the law permits. It could be anything up to 20 days. One thing I should say, I'm quite sure this doesn't belong to anyone round here. I'd definitely recognise it if it was from someone who lived here. So you don't think it was anyone local? Right. I'd say at a guess we're looking at a stolen vehicle here. I did wonder if it might have been. You hear such a lot about car thieves nowadays. Well, we certainly will be looking into that possibility. Anyway, thank you for contacting us, Mrs. Shefford, and we'll keep you informed of what happens. Right. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Talk about this year's International Food Festival. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, everyone. Today we have a special guest speaker. Laura Lanthor is director of the International Food Festival this year. Laura, can you tell us about what to expect at the festival? Of course, Vincent. This spring, people in the city can go to the 7th Annual International Food Festival. This is a special event for the whole family. I do have to tell you, though, we are holding it at a different date than before. Easter is exceptionally early this year, and if the festival were held as usual, it would have fallen on the same weekend. This year, the festival will be held on the first week of April, before Easter. The festival will be held at the Walker Field Grounds and will be divided into four main areas. There will be a Western food area with authentic representations of European cuisine. There will also be an East Asian section with chefs and products from Japan, Korea, and China. A South Asian section will have food from India, Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia. For the first time this year, we will also have a Latin American section where people can try things from Mexico, various Caribbean countries, and South America. There will also be special booths where people can learn about all these cuisines. This year, we are expanding the cooking workshop and demonstration portion of the festival. Attendees last year really seemed to like learning about food and having a hands-on experience. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. I'll give you a brief description of three of the workshops we have. Like I said, these allow you to participate directly in the making of food and teach you techniques you can use at home. For a full list of them, please go to our online website. We will give you the site address after the end of my talk. You will also find there the procedure to pre-register for the workshops. Pre-registration takes place when you buy your festival tickets and is highly recommended. Non-Western food has become increasingly popular these days and many people are interested in how to cook such food at home. 
Such cuisines use a variety of different spices, ones that aspiring cooks might not be familiar with. Therefore, our world tour of spices is a good introduction to the flavor profiles of other cuisines. I would recommend it for adults who want to seriously learn about cooking. Small children might not take to the more exotic spices. One workshop that is meant for children is Candy Adventures. There are traditional activities like making gingerbread houses. Other activities teach basic decorating techniques, including the proper use of coloring dye. Kids can also learn how to make flowers and other objects out of cake frosting. We understand the concerns of parents regarding their children's health, so everything used in this workshop is either sugar free or uses acceptable sugar substitutes. Lastly, we have a workshop that is suitable for the whole family. Salads Forever is a workshop for everyone interested in healthy eating. There will be different kinds of salads that people can try and demonstrations that show how to make them. Salads have grown in popularity these days and are a healthy addition to any diet if prepared the right way. The workshop will also teach how to make healthy salad dressings. I'm afraid that's all I have today. Please visit the festival website for more details. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3 on page 130. Section 3. You will hear part of an interview between Dr. Hilsden, a member of staff on a fashion design course, and a student, Julia, who is applying to do the course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Right, Julia. So, from your CV and portfolio, and what you've already told me, you seem to be very much the sort of person we're looking for on the postgraduate course. So tell me, you finished your fashion design course in London four years ago. Did you think of carrying straight on and doing a higher degree at the time? Yes, but there were financial pressures, so I ended up working in the retail industry, as you can see from my CV, mm -hmm. and actually it was a very useful experience. Hmm. In what way? Well, I was lucky to get the job with Fashion Now, they're a big store, and one of my priorities was to get as much experience as possible in different areas, so that was good because I had the chance to work in lots of different departments. And having direct contact with the customers meant I was able to see how they reacted to innovation, uh, to new fashion ideas. Because with Fashion Now, a designer might show something in New York or Milan, and there'll be something similar in the shop within weeks. So that was probably the most useful thing for me. Right. And so what's made you decide to do a postgraduate course now? Um, well, while I enjoyed working at Fashion Now, and I learned a lot there, I felt, uh, well, the way forward would have been to develop my managerial skills, rather than my skills in fashion design, and I'm not sure that's what I want to do. Mm, yes. When I was doing my degree in London, I'd been interested in women's wear, but I know that there's been a lot of work done in areas like new fabric construction, and though I'm not intending to go too deeply into the technology, I'd be very interested in looking at how new fabrics could be used in children's wear. So I'd like the chance to pursue that line. Yes, good. 
And are you at all concerned about what it's going to be like coming back into an academic context after being away from it for several years? No, I'm looking forward to it.、Huh. But I'm basically more interested in the application than the theory, or at least that's what I've found so far. And I'm hoping the course will give me the contacts and skills I need eventually to set up my own enterprise. I'm particularly interested by the overseas links that the department has. Yes, many of our students look overseas or to international companies for sponsorship of their projects. You now have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. On pages one hundred and thirty and one hundred and thirty one. Now listen and answer questions twenty four to thirty. And the facilities here look excellent. I just went to look at the library. It's really impressive. There's so much room compared with the one at my old university. Yes, most students find it's a good place to study,、mm. and there are link-ups to other universities, of course, and all the usual electronic sources. The staff run an information skills program, which we recommend all postgraduates do in the first week or two. Design students find these special collections particularly useful. Yes. Then we have a separate computer centre, which has its own academic coordinator, Tim Spender. He's got a background in art design, and the ethos of the centre is that it's a studio for innovation and creativity, rather than a computer laboratory. Oh right, I liked the study spaces where students can sit and discuss work together. Very useful for joint projects. We always had to do that sort of thing in the cafeteria when I was an undergraduate,、mm -hmm. and I read in the brochure that there's a separate resource for photography. Yes, it's called Photo Media. It's not just for photography, but things like digital imaging and new media. It's a resource for all our students, not just fashion design, and we encourage students to work there, producing work that crosses disciplinary boundaries. It's well used. In fact, it's doubled in size since it was set up three years ago, and we also have an offshoot from that, which is called time-based media. This is for students who want to develop their ideas in the area of the moving image or sound. That's in a new building that was specially built for it just last year, but there are plans to expand it as the present facilities are overstretched already. Right. Now.、Uh, Is there anything you would like to ask about the course itself? Um, I know it's a combination of taught modules and a specialist project,、mm -hmm. but how does assessment fit in? Well,、uh, as you'd expect on a course of this nature, it's an ongoing process. The degree course has four stages, and there are what we call progress reviews at the end of each of the first three. Then the final assessment is based on your project. You have to produce a report, which is a critical reflection on your work. And is there some sort of fashion show? There's an exhibition. The projects aren't all focused on clothes as such. Some are more experimental, so that seems more appropriate. We ask representatives of fashion companies along, and it's usually well attended. Right. And another thing I wanted to ask. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Into section four. Section four. You will hear a student representative explaining the views of the student body about how a large donation to the school should be spent. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for asking the student body about the recent large donation to our school and what it should be spent on. Also, thank you to the rest of the Board of Trustees for letting us have some say over how to improve our university. We know that sometimes students and administration have different priorities regarding the development of the school, but we hope you sincerely consider some of the ideas that are proposed. When the estate of Paul A. Madrib announced that he had left over $50 million to the school, the whole community was quite ecstatic and very grateful for such a generous gift. Since the initial euphoria has passed, though, we have all realized that some tough decisions have to be made. The donation can help fund new projects for the school or improve existing facilities and programs. But there is not enough money to pay for every single idea. That is why the University Senate, through an online survey, asked the student body what ideas they thought were best. The first part of this survey consisted of an open question. Students could list any number of different ideas. The results were then compiled in order to do a second online survey. Ideas that were totally impossible, or those that were jokes, were taken out. All the ideas that consistently came up again and again were put to a vote. We found that the four things that came up the most were all pretty different. I will mention them briefly before going over the pros and cons of each of them. In the first part of the survey, we saw over and over again that students wanted to improve the residential dormitories, completely redo the campus dining system, remodel the athletics building, and finally increase funding for research projects and grants, especially for those in science. Obviously, there is not enough money from the donation to pay for all those ideas, so we have to prioritize. The ideas that got the most votes were improving the residential dormitories and completely redoing the campus dining system. They both got 30% and 28% respectively of students saying that was what most of the money should be spent on. Many of the dorm facilities are quite old and definitely need some repair particularly the shared bathrooms. Also, students have been complaining for a while that there is not an adequate number of dining facilities on campus and that the quality of the food at existing places is low. Spending most of the donation in these areas will definitely improve the quality of life on campus. However, a significant minority of the student population, about 40%, does not live on campus. They commute from their homes elsewhere and therefore would not benefit from those improvements. 25% of students thought improving the athletics building was the best use of the money and 17% voted for giving money to research projects for science. There are many people who are attracted to our university because of our athletics programs, so improving the building would improve the reputation of the university. Only a small percentage of students actually ever use the athletics building, however. Though it received the fewest votes, giving money to university research projects has great potential. Any new patents that come about because of that research can possibly earn the school lots of money. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. 